On today's Transport Evolved, we find out why 60% of orders for the Nissan Leaf in Japan are from old people. We look at the smart electric drive touching shores in the USA. We look at the latest from the TTX GP with David Heron and what geeks look for in green cars. Coming up next on Transport Evolved. It's time to evolve your transport. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and welcome to episode number three of Transport Evolved for Thursday 10th of June 2010. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. And I'm Mike Boxwell. How are you today, Mike? Oh, you know how it is, Nikki. You know, straining up under the bear or uh, bearing up under the strain. Something like that. Something like that, yep. Do you know yeah, what? Nice. I learned the rule number one of podcasting yesterday, which is you do not. And I've done this before. You never, ever, ever, ever disclose who your guests are going to be before you go live on air with a show. Ah, just You just don't do it. Yes. You just don't ever be tempted to. Because you know what? It always goes wrong. Uh, mm. Yesterday, I think I was doing uh, the Twee podcast, This Week Energy. And I said, and tomorrow we've got uh, great guests lined up for tomorrow's show. And then at about two o'clock in the morning, I got an email from our guest to be saying, I'm really sorry, something bad happened at work yesterday and I've been input in charge of making it better. Um, it's cost a company quite a lot of money and they need it fixed now. Ergo, I cannot join you at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, f to take part in the show. I'm not going to say who it is because I feel really bad for him. Um, and we've been trying to get another guest lined up for today's show and everyone seems to be out of the country or on holiday or something. So this is the first time in my podcasting career where I've not had a guest with me. We've just got two hosts, but it's we can cope, us. can't we? We can, we can. We um, And we do have someone who said they'd come and join us. And I think what happened, what may happen is they might just pop on later on in the show. So if that happens, we'll, uh, we'll bring them into the conversation. So Absolutely. what's been going on in the world of alternative and green energy this week, Mike? It's been an interesting old week this week. Um, you know, it's, uh, the Mitsubishi iMeve is uh, slowly going out into other countries, so we're seeing it in Australia this week. Uh, charging points starting to appear across the, across the world, which is great. And uh, a rather amusing story, I think we might start, perhaps with the carbon footprint of cycling that The Guardian came up with. Uh, the Guardian <laughs> is an English on, newspaper. Oh. Carbon footprint of, of not cycling. motorcycling, but no, bicycle, bicycling. bicycle cycling. Absolutely. Basically, they're How saying that, um, they work that it's, out? it's human powered. So therefore, you've got to work out the the, the how much uh, energy you're using and where that energy comes from of course is food so you eat your food and then you can go uh, uh, cycling somewhere and and off you go and they've worked out that for cycling one mile the carbon emissions are between 65 grams of carbon dioxide and 2.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide depending on whether you've been eating bananas or air freighted asparagus <laughs> what they don't oh take into account gosh. of course is that if you don't uh, <laughs> if of course you drive you've still got to eat you can't sort of starve and not not feed and whatever but but there you go so they they've worked all this out and they've assumed 50 grams of co2 for the the build and the maintenance of the bike and everything else it's a rather fun article really except um they don't that they're sort of then saying that actually you know if you're 2.8 kilograms of co2 from eating asparagus you'd be better off driving a hummer which is fine but if you're driving a hummer you'll probably still be eating the asparagus so it makes no difference at all but there you go so uh, what the guardian are actually saying is you can choose to eat or you can choose to drive a car. Absolutely, but you can't do both. <laughs> but you can't do both. I'm sorry, that's not allowed. Uh, not, not within the um, 
Not within the... not within their calculations. They got the calculations a bit wrong oh. there. But, but well, they, they, it's a bit fun article. But what does concern me is that uh, that some people will take it and be a bit blase about carbon or, or whatever, and they say, "Oh yes, we, you know, I've got I drive a jeep, but therefore you know even cycling is is, is bad for the environment, so therefore I'm not making any difference." So um, yeah, that that's the, uh, the the problem with those sort of articles. But you know, we'll see. I mean, at the same time, Guardian have also uh, worked out the uh, the carbon footprint for the World Cup. That's the Soccer World Cup going on in South Africa. And they calculated that being 2.8 million tonnes. Right. And they calculated the carbon footprint of a nuclear war, which is 700 million tonnes. Right. So if there's anyone in Iran who's listening, don't do it. It's not good <laughs> for the environment. Do you know what I think... Um uh, one of the stories that I found quite amusing uh, this week was the whole um, Tesla thing. Uh, it's it surfaced in the last couple of weeks that Tesla um, have been selling green car credits, zero emissions car credits to um, Honda. Yes. Now, how this works is very similar to the carbon trading scheme that exists uh, in certain countries where someone who pollutes uh, can buy permission to pollute from somebody who has some spare uh, credits available. And of course, in the automotive world, Tesla only produces electric vehicles. And the laws in California, the C-A-R-B, the CARB laws, um, mm. which I think were revised last in 2008. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. That's right, yeah. um, those laws mandate anybody who wants to sell an, a vehicle in uh, the state, the great state of California, must produce X percentage of their cars that they produce must be zero emissions plug-in vehicles. Now, of course, Honda produces the FCX Clarity, the fuel cell vehicle. And in fact, they've mm. got several um, at points throughout California where they're leasing and maintaining and they've got charging this, you know, the hydrogen highway you remember Arnold Schwarzenegger and his hydrogen-powered Humvee. Um, but, of course, that doesn't count as being plug-in vehicle because the only thing you do is plug in the, the fuel filler when you fill it up with hydrogen. So mm. in order for, for Honda to be able to sell vehicles in California, what they've done is they've said, uh, OK, we need to buy some credits, some permission. Uh, the credits as if... I, we've made them ourselves and when we haven't. And so they've bought these credits off Tesla, who've got some to spare. And Tesla have made $13.8 million. Wow. Just by selling carbon credits to car companies who need them. Yeah, it just sounds to me that uh, it's... It kind of defeats a lot of the objective because presumably the mandate was brought in to reduce pollution and carbon emissions. And if electric car manufacturers are allowed to sell the credits, it means the pollution levels stay the same as before. There's no incentives for the big right. car manufacturers Absolutely. to build a plug in vehicle. It so, any, if, if anyone buys an electric vehicle, you know, an owner buys an electric car uh, in order to try and reduce their own personal pollution, the reality is that under these sort of trading schemes, they're making no difference at all. It yeah. just means that, in fact, the, the, the pollution goes up. There was a similar report uh, in Europe last last year which said that basically electric cars uh, with a carbon trading scheme actually increase carbon emissions because, in effect, you've, you've still got the pollution coming out from the... Uh, the, the power stations, yep. but in addition to that, you, you're all uh, you, you know they're regarded as being zero emissions, so therefore higher emission vehicles can be sold elsewhere. So nothing against electric vehicles, you know, electric vehicles are good for the environment, but the, the, these trading schemes which are around at the moment, and thankfully they are being phased out. These are short term things, but in the, in the short term, actually, it, it achieves it effectively means there's no benefit to the environment at all, which is crazy. What would you rather? Um, what would you rather Honda did? Well, the Obviously. rules are quite clear. You build a plug-in vehicle if you yeah. want to build. If you want to, it doesn't have to be fuel electric either. Vehicle. It could be. No. Um, uh, it could be. Um, it, it could be a a, a plug-in hybrid. Mm. It doesn't Absolutely. have to no, be. No, 
to be fair, Honda are doing a lot of stuff with hydrogen, and they could argue, and probably would be the case, that the, the Californian regulation should have included mm. hydrogen. You know, uh, with you know, with a a, a fuel a hydrogen highway in place in California, you just thought they'd have included that, but they didn't. So, um, you know, what they really ought to be doing is playing by the rules. You know, yeah. If Honda, if Honda can't play by the rules, then they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to to buy a get out of jail free it, card, which is actually what they've done. Yeah, yeah, that that it, 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 that's not that's not. I don't know. I mean, I've heard some people say, some people have said, you know, this is a really good idea because it means that car companies who, who 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 do play by the rules, get to make extra money. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, fair enough comment. If you if you make uh, electric cars and you make an excess of electric cars, why not make some money from the fact that you do something that nobody else does and you've got these credits? But I I, I hear what you're saying, and I mean I've heard that that argument before many many times from people saying, look, we don't we don't think it's fair that. Um, these car companies are effectively, because they're big car companies, they can buy their way out of not mm. producing uh, a new fuel type vehicle. Um, on well, in- I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. Well, the reason I think it's ridiculous is that you've got a situation where people can buy, if you like, carbon credits by planting trees and all these different projects going on. But it's it's they've, it's now reversed. You've now got a, de- a carbon debit scheme for people who are. Uh, who are ahead of the game? You know, it's a bit like having a TV advert saying, you know, if if you're an electric car owner, why not donate your your free credit so that your next door neighbour can can drive her uh, her two kids to school every day? It's only going to cost you, you know, a donation of thirty dollars a week for gas, and they can drive their their vehicles, their their people to to, to school. And it's just ridiculous. That's exactly what it comes down to. It's you know, it, it's just daft. Yeah, yeah, I, I can. So, uh, I can imagine. I can imagine it not being particularly useful. Let's put it like that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in in Honda's defence, Honda are producing a clean emissions vehicle. It just they happens are. Yeah, to I mean, not I be admit, it, a, a plug-in vehicle. And and while I am a plug-in, you know, I'll put my 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 hands up here and say, in in my ideal world, everyone would be driving a plug-in vehicle. I, I appreciate that that's not everybody's cup of tea. It's not everybody's idea of, of getting from A to B. Um, and there are uh, some situations where a hydrogen fuel cell car may be a better alternative, provided mm. A, B, C, D are met in the interim period, which at the moment they're not very expensive. They're 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 quite yep. uh, difficult to to find hydrogen in an ecologically responsible way to create the hydrogen to run it. So while it may be zero emissions at the tailpipe, it's not zero emissions and it has a larger carbon footprint than an equivalent electric vehicle. But I mean, mm-hmm. I think I think maybe in this case, uh, Honda can, I think it's okay for Honda to buy these credits. And, and you know, if they didn't from Tesla, would Tesla be, uh, you know, be much further out of pocket? And te- let's let's face it, Tesla have got some serious financial difficulties at the moment. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you know, uh, thirteen million dollars comes in handy from now, now and then, doesn't it? So uh, I can see from Tesla's point of view why they wanted to, why they wanted to do it. You know, if the rules the rules allow them to do it, and it, it helps their financial situation. Then then why not? What I'm uh, questioning is, you know, it, the the whole idea of a of a carbon credit a credit scheme. Um, effectively means that, that people can pl- say they're green and everything else, but the re- reality is there's no real difference in the, at the end game. And surely this is too important an issue to be, you know, pleasing the politicians. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Tesla Toyota thing is mm. not happening yet. What's that all about? So last couple of weeks ago, we said that Tesla and Toyota were going to be working together in a joint venture. Yeah. And now, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess it takes a case uh, a time to sort out all the details on these sort of things. I mean, the 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 deal was announced, but uh, you know, the, sorting out all the nitty gritty, they said at the time was going to take several months. I mean, I, I I think the idea was that Toyota would end up effectively taking their shares October, November this year anyway. So, um, you know, it, it, there was always going to be a, a delay before 
the, the whole thing got sort of thrashed out. So let's see what happens. Yeah, and 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 maybe they shouldn't announce well, it in the first place. They, <laughs> the, 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 the the story goes uh, that they because at the time I think people kind of read into the story. Oh, Tesla and Toyota are going to be building a car together. Mm. and it's going to be a new brand of vehicle and it's going to be electric and it's going to be sexy and everything else. And Tesla and Toyota said, look, actually, that's not what we're going to do. Mm. We might uh, we might be sharing the factory. We might be sharing ideas, but we're certainly not going to be working together to produce a new car. Um, and uh, the Wall Street Journal um, pulled a recent stock filing um, and it says, you know, the companies haven't yet said signed a deal that that of 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 have made Toyota agree to build a new EV at new at the new me at the new me plant. Um, so at the moment, it may not happen. It just like it may well, happen. It and I think I think give what we have time. to remember I mean, is, it... you know, the the auto industry is so fickle, and there are so many connections. I mean, I think we we talked about this last week when we had Chelsea Sexton mm. on the show. If we had that many links between the number of um, the different car companies that are connected with each other, you just have this intricate web of of yeah. of, of of links. They're all um, connected to each other somehow. But I mean, you know, the, uh, it's a big deal, that, you know, the, you know, between Tesla and Toyota, and, and it just isn't going to get thrashed out in just one meeting. You know, they, they've they've worked out the big details, and now they're looking looking at all the smaller stuff and seeing how it will actually all work in practical in practical ways. So, uh, you know, there's going to be some times when you're not going to hear any news at all. There's going to be other times you're going to hear things which are going to sound negative, and it's just simply, you know. Two big companies, or you know, one big company and one medium-sized company, working together and trying to find out, you know, where where the, where the limitations are and what you know where the boundaries are, and uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, well, that's a fair enough comment to make. It's a fair enough comment to make. Let's uh, let's move on now to um, mm. to a story that I broke on Monday uh over mm. at allcarselectric.com and after last week's show i got told off by one of our listeners and i really i felt really guilty about it afterwards i'm really really sorry patrick if you're listening i'm sorry because he said am i the only one who's sick and tired of hearing about nikki's ipad and ipod and i thought oh crikey do i talk <laughs> about them that much and apparently i do so i'm i'm really sorry about that, patrick i mean did not mean to offend um but this is a Mac story, so here's my high tech, Patrick. Here's my high tech phone. There you go. <laughs> um, it's sort of circa sort of nineteen um, nineteen ninety, I think. This particular phone I've got in my hand here. If you haven't got a webcast, it's just a big black brick like you'd normally get in the early nineteen nineties, and it's uh, <laughs> it's got a, a battery life of about five minutes, and that's if you don't use it. So if you use it, it's about thirty seconds. <laughs> And it does me absolutely fine because it means that I can't take a call, which is great. So I've got all the, the none of the stress of being in con a connection to the world, uh, the, the rest of the world whenever I'm out and about. Brilliant. But when anyone asks, yeah, I've got my phone on me. Mm -hmm. It's an emergency phone, isn't it? It's very good. Very good <laughs> idea. More people should do that. <laughs> but this story is about Mac. I'm sorry. It's about Apple. I'm sorry about this. I it really about the leaf. do apologise. Okay. Uh, shall we backtrack a bit? And a couple of weeks, about a week ago now, I wrote an article that said that the Nissan Leaf is more like a Mac, and the and the the Chevy Volt is more like a PC. And I wrote this on a Friday. It was supposed to be a tongue in cheek Friday article, light hearted, just to make people you know giggle and chuckle about it and and not take it seriously. Two things I realised about that one people take you seriously even when you're smiling and you've got a tongue in your cheek you know oh, yes. it, so i got quite a lot of hate mail about that and um <laughs> i'm really sorry i upset so many people i i honestly did not mean to do that um but there are you know over 50 comments now on, on that slating me so you can imagine my uh you can imagine my amusement on monday when the apple worldwide developer conference uh kicked off and uh, the CEO of Apple, Steve Jobs, came on stage and, you know, did his spiel about the new gadgets that they're bringing out. And of course, one of them is the iPhone uh, 4. And uh, he demonstrated the iOS 4, which is the operating system that this new phone will run. And as part of that, uh, the, Apple are working on something called iAds, which allows companies, partner companies, to embed advertising within an application in an unintrusive way so that but enables 
customers to click on the ad if they want to see it and, and go through and run like a mini applet, like a mini application that runs within whatever they happen to be, be running. And the one mm. that they chose to demonstrate was an ad from Nissan. Nissan are one of their first partners. And I found that later on in the week, apparently Nissan and Apple have the same ad agency. Ah. So that's possibly why this happened. But Steve Jobs, <laughs> live on air, live on stage, flashes out his iPhone and goes through this sign-up process for the Nissan Leaf mm. uh, and enters a competition to win one, as well as signing up for one. Of course, we all know uh, he didn't really do that. You know, a couple of people said, oh, did he sign up for an iPhone? No, I'm sure he didn't. He's a Mercedes SLK man, isn't he? he uh, sorry, an AMG 50. He drives an AMG 55, I think, with no license plates, which is a terribly mm. arrogant thing to be doing. In the UK, the only person who can drive without license plates is the Queen. Yeah. Well, mm, uh, I believe it's a felony for him to be doing it. It's about $250 fine, but when you're... That's about the same as, 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 as half-filling the tank on one of those AMGs, isn't it? Uh, one of my uh, our friends has got one. It's a fantastic car, but boy, oh boy, does it drink gas. I think he gets about 12 miles to the gallon. Yeah, but come on, if you're Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates That's or any, uh, anybody else, you know, Silicon Valley you wouldn't notice startup it. king, who's, who's, who's turned good. I mean, they, they back, back in the early days of Silicon Valley, they started up. They're now multi-billionaires. Mm. He's not going to care about That's paying true. a fine if he didn't doesn't display his license plate, is he? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he did this, you know, this demonstration on air, uh, showing everyone how to go about um, setting up a reservation for the Nissan Leaf. And I, I was really quite impressed. Um, uh, someone said to me, no, he just entered a competition, but he didn't. He did actually sign up, went through the sign up process as well. But of course, it was all just demonstration fake thing. So there you go. You you heard it here first. Mm. Nissan and Apple. There you go. Sitting in so, the dream. So all the ever, the General Motors is absolutely curious at you. Why? Because if you'd done it the other way around, the, 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 it seemed Jobs would no doubt have demonstrated the sign up process for a, for a vault instead. Oh, you think I have Steve no? Jobs here, eh? I only <laughs> wish. <laughs> I'd give him a piece of my mind about some of his dumb decisions he's made over the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with the Nissan Leaf, uh, mm, yeah. going over to Japan, um, there has been a, uh, they've kind of sold out of, of, no, they haven't sold out. Let me get this right. They fulfilled their order books for the first year in Japan of the Nissan Leaf. They've got enough yep. orders now to have met their goals for the year, their sales goals for the year. They're still they taking, yep. uh, they're still taking orders. But the really cool thing is, and I didn't think about this, 60% 60% of the pre-orders for the Nissan Leaf are from over 50s, over 60s. Mm -hmm. The baby boomers, effectively. That figures. I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of older people. You know, when it, when you when you get to sort of 50, 60, 70 years old, you're not going to be uh, necessarily doing the same sort of long distances as, as, as you do before. A lot of people have retired, mm -hmm. so you know they uh, they're not doing work mileage as, as such. And a lot of people, you know, they, they, they their family live nearby, their friends live nearby. You know, why would they ever want to go long distance? So, if, if certainly if they've got two cars in the family and great, they've got disposable income, then go for it, go for an electric car. But, it, but even if you've only got one car in the family, then for a lot of people, an electric car will do absolutely fine. The thing that I think surprised me about it all is that you, uh, you know, traditionally we tend to think of old people as being a bit stuck in their ways, um, a bit, yeah, a bit, a bit unsure a when it comes to change. Yeah. You know, not liking technology, not wanting to make that that step forwards into the scary new world of of you know gadgets and doodads and and I, I, I don't think that's true anymore. I mean, you know, uh, here in the UK, the solar hot water panels that sort of thing. The the the, the demographic of the people who've been buying them, a lot of them are fifty years old, sixty years years old plus. I mean, my parents have, have, have both talked about electric cars and said, yeah, they would actually an electric car would suit them perfectly for the sort of driving they do. And uh, you know they're actually quite pro 
pro uh, pro change and pro doing this sort of thing. And I think that's a, that's true of an awful lot of people. So yeah, okay, yeah, you do get some people who are st- stuck in the mud, but you get that from twenty, thirty year olds as well as from sixty year olds. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I. Know. <laughs> we well, both can think of people who, uh, uh, who fit that. Yeah, I know people you know, in their 30s 30. who just do not know how to do, use a piece of technology. I know people in their 40s. I know people in their teens who don't. You just don't get it. Um, and that's kind of quite bizarre for me, it must be said. It's that, that kind of idea of, really? You're, you're a teenager <laughs> and you don't get technology. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, let's move on. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, 60% are, are pre-orders. I think right. the thing that really shocked me about it, other than the age, um, mm-hmm. was um, the fact that, that that they are willing to move to electric uh, rather than the hybrid. I know that when the Prius came out, the hybrids, um, it was 97 the Toyota Prius came out in Japan. That's right. Uh, they were very popular amongst little old ladies because they weren't particularly powerful cars. They looked mm-hmm. kind of fairly dull and boring. The first generation yep. Prius was, wasn't um, mm-hmm. a, a, a design tour de force. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it nicely. <laughs> it was a saloon. It wasn't. It was a sedan. It wasn't mm. a hatchback. It was a sedan. So, you know, that was fairly conventional styling for the time, um, and it came with. Yeah. This is the funny bit. They came with alloy wheels, but they also had plastic hubcaps. And apparently the, the, the logic behind that was they didn't want um, uh, they didn't want the little old ladies to damage the alloy wheels whilst parking the vehicle, parallel parking it to the curb. So they put plastic hubcaps on. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, it would be a fantastic little <laughs> story if it was, wouldn't it? Um <laughs> Uh, and and you know and and so they were very very popular and there was tale of this little old lady in Japan who got a huge number of miles per gallon from her Prius mm. the hypermiling because she was driving it so blinking slowly um, so I, <laughs> I I I can't wait to see hear tales of of little old Japanese ladies with the Nissan Leaf driving it you know two hundred miles on a charge and then two hundred miles on a charge but, yeah hmm. but I think if you're if you're a pensioner you are a little bit more careful with your money. Yeah. Then if you're not working, yeah, then. I mean it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. The, the the cost of the car is is uh, you know the, the the Nissan Leaf is reasonable when compared to a top of the range you know, sort of Prius and you know, Volkswagen Golf and the vehicles like that. Um, you know, it's not cheap. There's no doubt about that. And it's certainly not as cheap as the lots of the range models from Toyota and Volkswagen. But um, you know, once you've got the car, you haven't got your fuel costs. Uh, especially in Europe, when that when the car comes over here, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be interested because the cost of leasing the car per month is likely to be less than they're paying at the moment just on gas, just on putting fuel into the car. So I can see a lot of people being uh, being very interested in it because effectively the car's free because they're paying for it with their with their uh, fuel money. Hmm. So um, I, I, I can see that a lot of pe- that an electric car will appeal to a lot of people who are, you know, careful with their money. Yeah, I suppose so. And also, of course, Japan, although it's quite a, a, a um, it's a very densely populated place, isn't it? Most people live mm. in the cities and then and towns and live in the coast rather than the centre. So I think that probably helps. Um, and of course, there is a third reason why my more uh, older people in Japan are, are ordering the the Leaf. And that is that if you think about it, um, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a, a fairly large house, the more yeah. likely you are to have off street parking. Yeah. Uh, and the more likely you are to have a bit of spare cash to spend on it if you've been lucky and, and saved up. Now, mm. in Japan, are you familiar with a K class law, Mike? Yeah, you've got to have a car that can fit into your pocket and. <laughs> and, you know all this sort of stuff. Yeah. You, can, you can only park it on uh, in a um, uh, on a postage stamp, and yeah, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's a little rude way of putting it, but yeah, the idea is um, <laughs> with the K class law. What what you have with the K class law is if um, you have to be able to prove that you can park your car off road and you've got somewhere to park it at night time, or you mm-hmm. can't buy the car. That's the rule. You have to actually prove to the car salesman that you've got somewhere you can park the car at night in general. 
And they'll say, yep, yep, okay, you can have the car, you can do it. The K-Class, spelt K-E-I, the K-Class cars, um, they are exempt from the red legislation. So you can legally park a K-Class car on the road at night without a parking permit. Um, and uh, let me think, what cars do we know that fit into that? Uh, there's a Suzuki Cappuccino, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little two-seater sports car. Um, we don't see that many of these cars in in, in the in Europe because they're very narrow cars. As you well see as them short. down under a lot in Australia. Lots of people get the right. A-class cars because there's also regulations in Japan. You can only, I think, uh, I think all cars in Japan that get used on the roads have to be a certain age or under. And I believe it's yes. seven years. After seven years, you can't use them anymore. And again, mm, if I'm if I'm right. talking off the top of my head, tell me because this is what I remember of the legislation. <laughs> and they get shipped out to New Zealand. Ah, gotcha. You get lots of they New got, Zealanders and lots of Australians cars. buying them because they they buy older Japanese cars that get shipped across um, because they don't have such as such strict laws over there um, when it comes to the age of the vehicle. They just want them to be rust free and in good condition. Mm. Um, I mean, they could always sell them into America as well. But with the K class laws, you'd actually have to have two, wouldn't you? One for each foot. Michael. <laughs> that's a really well, rude a roller thing to say. Well, they're, they're sort of roller skate type vehicles. I mean, you know, uh, here in Europe, we like slightly larger cars than the, the Japanese, and in America, they like, like larger cars again. And I think if you took a K-class car, car over to America, they, they wouldn't believe, you know, people would actually want to buy them. Actually, I think there, are, there, are, there, there would be a market in America for K-class cars. Okay. I think... In certain areas, there would be a market for K-class cars. And we're going to move on now to a story because you just brought mm. it up. We're going to move on yeah. now to a story about the smart car. Yes. Now, the smart car launched in um, America in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, it's being sold in America for about, I think, six years unofficially, you know, being imported privately and, and, and having, you know, particular low volume imports of the vehicle. But it's been... Uh, it's been imported officially by Smart USA since 2008. Mm. And uh, in fact, our, our friend Chelsea, who was on last week, she drives one. She's got a little smart car. Um, and the smart car uh, is quite popular on the East Coast, quite popular on the West Coast, not so popular in the middle, which is, is fair enough because obviously it's not so built up in the middle of the states. Um, yeah. On the eastern seaboard and on the West Coast, there's there's much more densely populated areas much more, you know, uh, restrictions on parking. And uh, and so the smart car is more naturally at home there than it would be in, in the central part of, of North America. Um, mm. Interestingly, Canada has been importing the smart car for many years. And, and in fact, they have okay. diesel smart cars in yeah. Canada, um, like mine, um, which are very, very mm. fuel efficient. And, uh, you know, if you want to have a an evolved kind of transportation experience, they're not bad because they get 70 or 80 miles to the gallon uk uh miles to the gallon which is about 60 miles to the gallon in the us about 60 miles to the gallon in the us and how many yeah about liters that. per hundred kilometer it's pretty low isn't it mm, about three or four uh, liters per hundred kilometer for, for the, it, yeah it'd be about three and a half liters yeah. i guess um which is is really good very very low emissions mm. for the diesel ones and the petrol ones are not bad either um now mm. obviously <laughs> There's been some trouble in the States. We talked about this again last week when we were talking about crash tests and there being some issues with, with certain companies not liking, uh, certain people not liking the smart car. It's a dangerous vehicle. It's a, you know, it doesn't have crash barrier, enough crash protection, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we talked about this last week. Smart car is designed. Mm. If it gets hit, it stops working. Yeah, um, throw it away. And you throw one. it away. And you buy... Um, Something anyway. else. You buy something yeah. else. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, the uh, uh, when the car first came out, uh, it went through undergo went all the crash tests in Europe back in ninety eight, wasn't it? The first one, ninety yeah. seven, something like that. And uh, you know, it performed well for it. You know, at, at the time um, because they managed to persuade people that you know the, the safety cage is strong, but everything else around it will just fall apart. And, and you know, that's fine because at the end of the day, if you're in a big accident, you care about the safety of yourself. You don't really care about your car mm. so much. You know, if, if it's completely destroyed, throw it away and get another one. Mm. If it saved your life, then that's, that's, that's all it's designed to do. Apparently, um, so in the chat room, uh, Doug said that um, it's not Chelsea who drives the smart, it's her husband, Bob. Bob, uh, Bob Sexton. Ah. Um, 
apparently Chelsea still got a Saturn because she used to work for Saturn. So, uh, but anyway, I know she drives it from time because if we've talked about it, um, but uh, the smart car, the smart electric drive, they've decided not to call it the smart ED. They've actually taken away the, mm. uh, <laughs> they've actually used the proper, proper words rather than the uh, shortened version. Apparently, because of what ED stands for in the US, and if you're not in the US, then you can just smile sweetly and know that it's something rude. Um, <laughs> pertaining to men, men's health. Should we, we leave it at that? Yeah, yes, yeah. it's something to do with men's health. Uh, so don't walk up to a man in America and say, do you own a smart ED? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the smart, the smart electric drive has just landed in America. It's uh, over in um, over on the East Coast at the moment in New York, New York City. And uh, some, some people have been driving it over there. Some journalists have been driving it. Now, uh, I'm not convinced that the smart electric drive is going to have a market in the States. Unless, why not? Unless uh, Smart USA and um, Mercedes Benz have done some really fantastic things with the vehicle. Because I've driven a first generation. Have you driven the electric Smart, Mike? I've no, I haven't. I've, I've I've ridden in it several times, but I've never actually had a chance behind the wheel. It's great fun around town. Uh, the Smart mm. ED in town is a fantastic vehicle. It's it's like its gasoline powered uh, counterparts. It's fun. It's All nippy. Right. It's really kind of you can do i mean you can get away with things right. in a smart car that you wouldn't be able to do in a regular car <laughs> you can park it at funny angles to the curb you can weed yeah, in and out of traffic fun. without slowing down uh it's it, but the g-wiz in that respect i, I did a race yeah. once between a g-wiz and a and a uh, 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 an mpv in uh, across reading in the uk which is a, a medium-sized town about a quarter of a million people we did the uh, the race during rush hour um uh, <laughs> we started from the same point we ended at the same point and basically who could get through the center of town in rush hour quickest and i did it in the gwiz 20 minutes quicker than the uh, than, than the mpv simply because i could squeeze through all the, the gaps and and just you know uh, have fun with it but yeah it, it would go, go through places where no no other car could so yeah i, I know what it means I mean, the smart <laughs> great fun and we I'd, i proved it. it could be the quickest way through a town with a with g wiz definitely um but i mean my point is uh in uh mm. in the uk when i just when i tried it recently uh, mm. it was last year sometime i tried it and i had this situation where uh the vehicle was great round town, but as soon as I got onto the freeway, I was vulnerable, and it wasn't just because it was a smart car. Yeah. Um. Have you? Because you've been a passenger. Have you ever experienced that? I've not been a passenger out on the on the open road. It was. Uh, we, I've been on a test track, and I've been on a uh, in in Birmingham in the UK. I had a, a ride through Birmingham in one. So uh, you know, it was. It's a city car. I mean, the, the smart has always been a city car. Um, of course, of the petrol and uh, sorry, gasoline and diesel versions. Yeah, you can drive anywhere you like. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that the the electric version just isn't quite powerful enough to to go out on the freeway. the The gas version is, even the diesel mm -hmm. one. I mean, the diesel one you wouldn't get yourself. You can get yourself in a lot of trouble in the diesel powered smart because it's only a seven hundred cc's. It doesn't have much torque. Yeah, it doesn't have Not much. Power. 16, 20 seconds. It will do eighty yeah. miles an hour at a push. 85 mm -hmm. if you're really lucky uh, which is about an indicated 1995 but um mm -hmm. it it will really struggle up hills <clears throat> unless it's it's already going with the the smart ed when i took it out on the freeway i discovered that i was halfway up the free you know halfway up the freeway and i hit a hill and i went oh this is not good i'm slowing down i'm slowing down and there were trucks that really really yeah. struggled uh, to 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 not overtake me and in fact a lot of them did and so mm. you're going down the freeway in a small car it's nine feet long five feet high and about five feet wide with a truck bearing down on you doing 60 miles an hour which is slow yeah in a regular car yeah. but if you're doing flat out 65 which is what i was doing in the in the electric smart it's a mm. really scary experience and i really think if 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 smart usa haven't changed the top speed of that vehicle and they bring it into the american market it is going to be laughed out of the place and someone yeah, in the I chat room has said you know just because the leaf can do 90 miles an hour doesn't mean you have to do 90 miles an hour 
No, it yeah, doesn't. I, I, I mean, I, I, I regularly I, drive it. I drive my smart car at 65. I'll get on the freeway and I'll sit there at 65. But I tell you what, if a truck comes up behind me and wants to overtake, or if somebody, if I need to go faster, I can floor it and I can get out of that situation. My experience mm. when I drove that smart, it was a first generation smart car, uh, electric smart. My experience of that first generation electric smart car was it would accelerate up to 50 really quite quickly. Once it got to 50, you measured acceleration in weeks and you do not want to drive a vehicle on the road, on a public highway, in fast traffic that takes a long while to speed up and slow down. It's just not safe. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, uh, uh, it's choosing the right car for the environment. If you're very rarely getting out of, of, of... of, of a city centre, it's a second car, for instance, uh, and, and you're, you know when you are out of the city centre, you're you're on uh, smaller roads, and you know a car like the Smart is going to be absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, if you're expecting to uh, go sort of long distance on freeways, or you know, then choose a different car. You know, uh, you know you, nobody's forcing you to buy a Smart. Nobody's forcing you to buy anything else, and. Uh, uh, there is a market for it, but yeah, I do. What you, I I do know what you're saying. You've got to, have, uh, you know, th- there are some limitations on these electric cars. Top speed, the think is exactly the same. Top speed, 65 miles an hour. I've heard it's a bit better climbing up the hills than the the the, the smart. The think seems to will we'll do 65 miles an hour, I believe, even up the hills and what have you. Whereas the the smart does slow down a bit like the the original G Wiz. You go up the, the hill in the original G Wiz, and the the car slows down quite a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, and and yes, yeah, so I know exactly what you mean. It's a bit frightening, but you know, if you're going to do that sort of driving, then use a different car. The thing I would say though is I don't, I can't think of an area of the US. I might be wrong, and please tell me if I if I am wrong. I can't think of a of a town or a city in the US where there aren't fast roads. Somewhere in your neighbourhood. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I mean, I'm lucky. I live in a city in the UK. We are really rare in Bristol. We have a freeway that comes all the way into the centre of town. And actually, it's really quite nice because it means I can get (laughs) from my house, which is about five, ten miles out, into the centre of town really quickly. I just jump on the motorway and uh, the freeway and come straight into the centre of town. Um, mm. But that's unusual. Normally, you know, in the UK, the the freeway is on the outskirts of town and everything is low 30 mile an hour speed limits all the way into the centre mm. of town. Uh, and I, I, I can't place that in the States as being the norm. Because, you know, I've, driv- yeah, I've driven yeah. a lot around Washington, D.C. And my experience of that was there are freeways everywhere mm. straight into the centres of, 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 of town. And it... I, I, I just... Having seen smart cars on Highway 495, which is six lanes wide in places, eight lanes wide in places, I just can't see it happening. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Unless they put this top speed up. Now, someone said in the chat room, um, don't, don't add the, don't add the, the, the don't, sub- uh, sorry, I'm just trying to do two things at once now. Don't um, put the top speed down to increase your range. That is a really dumb way of doing it. And it seems that that is what they've done. They've increased your range. They've increased uh, the range by de- decreasing yep. the top speed because you have this, uh, you have this thing um, in, in the world of, uh, of, of electric vehicles where you can have speed, you can have range, or you can have acceleration, you can have two of those. So you can have a really fast, high accelerating vehicle with a low range, small range. You can have a, a small range, as you can have a large range, but be really slow, but accelerate quite quickly. You get the idea. Of course, um, the Tesla is one of the few vehicles that doesn't employ that. But, you know, say la vie. Hey, guess who we've just, just guess who has um, just joined us on the show? Just literally, yeah. just, he's just joining us now live on air um hello hello because he he he, hello this is aaron from the geek cast hi aaron how are you no probs it's very we had a little bit of a a confusion there aaron decided to uh to join us uh, for today's show 
at the last minute he offered to to come on because I was moaning on on Twitter about the fact that I'd uh, we'd had a few guest issues for the day today and uh, he's just come on from from the Geekcast. So tell us a little bit about the Geekcast, Aaron. Uh, sure. Uh, the Geekcast is pretty much a uh, geek lifestyle podcast uh, that we talk about pretty much everything. Green technologies. Uh, we've had uh, Chelsea on. We've uh, covered the uh, Nissan Leaf. Uh, but we go into pretty much everything. Gadgets, websites, apps, uh, y- you name it. Uh, we're there. And I, I got to say, uh, you know, geek lifestyle stuff is kind of the cool thing these days, uh, which is a little disappointing in, in a way. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. So geeks do like to have their their exclusivity, don't they? We we like to be an exclusive club. Of I mean, I, I'm kind of like a Mac guy, so I, I I even feel like okay, well, that was part of a cult, and now, uh, no, no, everyone's kind of like doing that too. So I'm gonna have to find a new operating system, <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think the funny thing uh, that uh, the funny thing that we 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 you know talked about it earlier on in the show today actually was um, uh, Mike and I were talking about. Um, the fact that I upset someone quite a lot last week um, on the show and I felt really bad about it because I just wouldn't shut up about my iPad. <laughs> well, hey, listen, it's something to brag about, so why not? <laughs> but it's not my <laughs> iPad, it's it. my wife's iPad, but we're not going to talk about that. We talk, we've already talked about the Nissan Leaf, um, mm. the Nissan Leaf at the uh, Worldwide Developer Conference. Uh, what was yes. your kind of impression? Advertising electric car live on stage at a geeky event like that. Uh, several I people said that, that Nissan and, and Apple have the same ad company. Um, I would not be surprised. I, I will say the ad that they played was uh, very nice. Uh, they were you know, definitely going for what they said their, their goal is, you know, the emotion and the interactivity. Um, I was actually more... Uh, excited for the fact that it was an event that gets a huge amount of people watching mm. and listening and live blogging that maybe not would have known about the Nissan Leaf. And now there's this consciousness that exists that did not exist before, even if it's for the few thousand people who were really into watching this whole thing. Uh, I think any exposure is great. And I think that if they're going to give away a car through the iAd platform, that is a fantastic thing to do. Um, but I saw Steve Jobs actually entered uh, into the contest. And <laughs> I just hope it's not him who wins because I'd be very disappointed. <laughs> well, we did have a little chat about that uh, earlier on the show today. And Mike and I decided that it was actually a fake uh, entry to the, uh, to the event. And also, a I hope fake- so. If I lose out to him, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I haven't been able to to apply yet. So there you go. If you, that's that's the excuse when you update your your if you've got an iPhone, update it and enter into the uh, competition to win the Nissan Leaf. Um, where were we in our show notes today, Mike? We've talked about. I can't the- remember. Before we go on to the show notes, I mean, uh, talking about sort of the geek and uh, type stuff and everything else. So I was at a developer, a small developer conference earlier on today and. Uh, uh, at lunchtime, everyone wants to come out in my electric car. So, you know, I, I had sort of four people off in my, uh, driving off in the Mitsubishi electric car. Everyone loved it, came back, given another four people. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And so on and so on until, until, um, I didn't have enough range to come home. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> It definitely does appeal, you know, it, that, you know to, to to you know IT type people. They, they love the idea of an electric vehicle. They really. I'll do. be completely honest with you. Now we have a local electric vehicle club uh, called Bevob. Very very silly acronym. Battery Electric Vehicles of Bristol, and we meet once a mo- once a month, and we meet at the local mall and where there's charging points for all the electric cars. And we turn up and we go out and have a meal and we just chat. Now, when it first started, everyone just chatted about electric vehicles. But now the words kind of got out. We have everybody from, you know, people who don't have electric vehicles, who really want one, who people who make their own. In fact, last time, I'll tell you what happened at the end of last week's last. uh, Yeah, it was uh, two weeks ago now at the end of the event. Um, we all got a phone call. Well, I got a phone call from from a guy who'd come over from Wales on his DIY built, diesel powered, biofueled motorbike. 
<laughs> which consisted of a 30-year-old motorbike frame and a 25-year-old generator that he had bolted literally to the motorbike. <laughs> How on earth it got the um, roadworthiness <laughs> test, I'll never know. But anyway, and he, he, he'd, you know, come down on the freeway and he'd, you know, he'd ridden about 30, 40 miles to get there and it had broken down at a local Ikea. And so we all ended up going down to this Ikea car park, all these electric vehicle nuts, to try and help him fix it. Nothing to do with electric vehicles, it's just we were really, really geeky, trying to figure out, oh, well, maybe the compression's off. Wow, have you thought about spraying in some <laughs> accelerant? <laughs> Someone in the chat room said, I wonder if I should build an electric Hindustan ambassador. If you no. do that, I will, I will want to have a ride. No. <laughs> Hindi ambassadors are one of the best cars built on an Oxford, Morris Oxford, aren't they, Mike? Morris Oxford, that's Yeah, second that's generation Morris Oxford, still made in India today. Fantastic little vehicles. Right, Fiat Panda. Mm. Mike, do you want to take out? Do you want to take that? Yeah, because we. I, I think don't think our American listeners will know what a Fiat Panda is because I don't think it's sold uh, over no, there. Well, no, it isn't. It's a Not car yet. driven by bears, years, maybe. Apparently. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's fueled the one. Yeah, by <laughs> fueled by bamboo shoots. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, is that why it's so yeah. so economical? <laughs> I think the fir the, the first generation Fiat band was actually made out of bamboo shoots, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> Fiat, obviously, uh, uh, well known in Europe, but nobody's heard of them in the states. Um, the cars are coming to uh, America next year. There'll be uh, badges, Chryslers and Jeeps and various other things. I believe the, the, the Panda four-wheel drive is going to be badges of a Jeep. Uh, maybe somebody can correct me on that. But it's it, it's a car based on the same floor pan as the Fiat 500, which you are going to, also going to be seeing next year. Um, anyway, the German Automobile Club have uh, been running an, uh, their annual comp competition to see how far a car can run on 30 euros, so that's about $36, of fuel. Right. And uh, this is in a country where fuel costs around five dollars fifty per gallon. So uh, uh, that's typically yeah. you know, something like a BMW X5, sorry X6 uh, hybrid will get manage about one hundred and six miles, and uh, you know your your average car will get sort of two hundred three hundred miles. Um, Fiat with the Fiat Panda uh, called Natural Power uh, managed to, to travel four hundred and fifty miles on natural gas. Um, is this CNG compressed natural, compressed natural gas? That's the one compressed natural okay. gas. Okay, so so how those work uh, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. But I'll just we'll just mm -hmm. tell everyone how this works because obviously transport evolved. We are electric car geeks, and that's how we started. And you know, I came over from the EV yeah. cast. And everyone knows that, but we are trying to cover all kinds yeah. of alternative energy vehicles. <laughs> so let me let me explain how it works. Mm. Um, natural gas burns clean more cleanly. Excuse me. Had a little coffee <clears throat> thing there. Uh, natural gas burns more cleanly than gasoline does. Am I right? That's right. Yes. Uh, but in order for it for it to 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 run, the engine has to be warm first. So these vehicles normally have a separate gas tank first, don't they? Gasoline uh, yeah, tank I mean, and the, the, compressed natural gas, unless the, en the engine's the, the been modified. One. Yeah, I mean, the, I, th I think nowadays uh, a lot of them. Uh, have now been modified, so you don't actually need any uh, any gasoline at all. Cool. But I, I don't I don't know the full details there, but I believe the, the Fiat one, you don't actually need any gasoline in there at all. <laughs> Someone said they think they misheard you saying badged as, as badgers. Ah. And if you want to be <laughs> okay. really, well, okay. really geeky... It can be a badger, a, a jeep badger. It can be thing, badger, 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 badger. Now, is there a large compressed natural gas infrastructure set up where Fiat is looking to roll this out? Because I know here, now I'm in New York, here in the US, and as far as you know, CNG goes, it's non-existent. There's maybe like two or three actual. Yeah. filling stations if you want to call it that and that's it so it makes driving one of these a little impractical even for around town because uh, i'm not going to keep one of these compressors at my house you know and blow it up <laughs> i mean some people do i mean yeah i mean uh you know, the, the, the um, compressed natural gas market in europe is still fairly small some countries have got a reasonably good infrastructure i believe italy has now got quite a uh, a good infrastructure for instance in austria uh, in the UK, you're right. You may get one or two 
uh, uh, filling stations in, in, in big towns, and that'll be about it. But where compressed natural gas has has made an impact is been on commercial vehicles, and they refuel at, at, at their depot. So you know, every morning before the guys the guys leave, they fill up and, and off they go. So um, in commercial vehicles, it has actually become a relatively popular option. Uh, for cars, it's still quite unusual, to be fair. Um, right. LPG, uh, liquid petroleum right. gas, has uh, has become more of a uh, m- certainly got more distribution, and you can go anywhere and get LPG nowadays. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting because uh, obviously fear, see a, an opportunity for na- natural gas, and in California, uh, Yellow Cab has uh, ordered twenty five compressed natural gas for Transit Connects this week uh, to run as taxis around uh, uh, in the big cities. So um, mm. it, it'll be interesting to see whether we're going to see more compressed natural gas and more alternative fuels appearing over the next sort of five, ten years or so. Interestingly, someone someone in the chat room has just said uh, that um, uh, CNG makes more sense uh, than hydrogen um, mm. fuel cell or hydrogen uh, combustion yeah. engine vehicles. Because at the moment, where do we get the hydrogen from to run hydrogen fuel cell cars? Yeah. Well, actually, it's reformed mm. natural gas. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So it's kind of one step down the road and actually saves a bit. But you know what? That that Fiat uh, Panda shares the same floor pan as the Fiat 500. Yep. And uh, I think the Fiat 500 is a much more sexy looking vehicle. I've got a friend with one. It is. She waited. I can't believe it. She waited. I think it was something stupid like three months for a Fiat three uh, for a Fiat 500. They are that popular, wow. and uh, and I can see an electric Fiat Five Hundred being quite in, at home in the streets of New York, Aaron. Uh, I I can absolutely see it. I, I've actually never heard of this car. I, I've heard of Fiat, uh, but never the Fiat Five Hundred. I'm taking a look at it here, and it it looks like a, a really sporty Mini Cooper. And yeah. uh, considering yeah, how parking does. is in in New York City, um, I would say it was probably the best motoring around car if you are going to have a car. Um, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, when you get into big cities here in the U.S., um, a lot of people actually opt to not have a car at all. They'll actually rely strictly on mass transit. And it's incredible to see the yeah. infrastructure that we have here for, you know, if you want to go somewhere that's, you know, 40, 50 blocks away, people have no problems hopping on a bus, walking, you know, 20 blocks or going on to the subway. And, but then you get into the situations where, you know, you do have to leave that city and and that place. And I think these smaller cars, uh, especially for just going around, I think would be fantastic. I would probably go for this Fiat 500 if, uh, you know, I was just made of money and can just buy cars left and right. (laughs) The funny thing, it's a good little car, and and the other thing is, I mean, it, it's not an expensive car. Um, you know, it it it's it looks good on the outside, yeah. it looks fantastic on the inside. It's the best looking car, and and got the best interior of any small it's car. It's got some pretty uh, good gadgets Europe. as well, as I remember. Yeah, I mean, it's got yeah. Bluetooth as standard, and I believe, I might be wrong, but my friend Chrissy's got one, and it's got like a little USB dongle that you l- yep. plop in the by the key. There we in the go. center console. All right. And it can tell you how efficiently you're driving. So you take it out of the car when you finish and you plug it into your computer and you go to the Fiat, I think it's a Fiat website or a program that you get when you get in the car and it logs your fuel okay. efficiency and it can help you to become a more efficient driver. And that is pretty cool. Mm. But uh, you might be able to help us with the story, Aaron, that we, we talked about earlier on, which is that the smart ED, mm. sorry, electric drive, has made it to <laughs> the shores of uh, of New York um, and is being test driven at the moment by by journalists uh, throughout the New York uh, area. Um, and, and I was saying that I didn't think that the smart electric drive has a market in the States because it's just based on the, the top speed. It's I believe it's only 65 miles an hour. We said we can't see anybody buying that if they want to make longer distance trips on in, on 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 freeways around a greater metropolitan area. And I cited Washington D.C. as being an example. You can't get anywhere right. in Washington in in the Washington D.C. metro area without going on a freeway. If you want, if you live in Maryland and you want to go into into D.C., you go on the freeway. If you go from Virginia yeah. in, into D.C., you go on the freeway. Right. And I just can't see this Absolute. vehicle with a, a low top speed, 65 miles an hour, you know, making it. But around town, 
it's the ideal vehicle because it's smart, it's small, it's snippy, and there was no pun intended there with the word smart. You know, they're great, <laughs> but uh, but not but not on the freeway. No, not at all. Doing 65 here on, on the highway will get you killed. Uh, I hate to say it, but uh, yeah, absolutely. you can really get into a, a big trouble driving driving the speed limit even. And 65 uh, he, uh, here uh, in New York is actually uh, over the speed limit in a lot of places. Um, as far as the Smart goes, I mean, thank God they're changing the name on it because uh, Smart ED, not, not good. Yeah, we've talked about um, that. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not a good moniker to have. Um, no. The other thing too is I'm just looking at a, an article from uh, 2008 from MSNBC where they talked about it and they were testing it. And they're saying it gets about 90 miles to a charge, which I don't know if as time has gone on that they're changing that. Um, that's a good range, I think, for daily commuting if you're doing, again, around town commuting. The smart, though, you know, I see them here and there. But I think it's a very niche car here in the U.S. You, you know, it's definitely for people oh, who are looking to get great mileage. But you can get almost the same mileage on a Toyota Prius, on a Honda Insight. And, you know, especially with the Leaf coming out and if the Tesla Model S hits production soon, that's, you know, higher end price, but still somewhat affordable to the, you know, you know, a little better than average income family. I think those will definitely take off a lot better. Um Given the fact on how it looks, I, I think they would either need to give it superior range or uh, maybe some sort of superior charging that would give right. it a benefit because we're all into looks of our cars here and this car just looks a little too odd, I think, to hit the mainstream. Yeah. You see, in the UK, When the we Smart love came out originally, uh, it came out uh, in the mainland Europe. It didn't come into you to start off with. And... Um, they they really targeted it as a niche vehicle, and to really appeal to uh, uh, to technical people and everything else, they built a huge vending machine, and they built this in a, a few of these. But the one I saw was in Amsterdam. It was seven foot, seven story high building as a vending machine, just glass and chrome and all that sort of stuff, stacked full of cars, and you could press buttons, and your car, the different cars would come up and down the uh, the vending machine, <laughs> and you could choose which one you wanted, put your credit card in, and out came your car. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can't get much more geeky than that. But this is I what they, they, say, bought. So they didn't sell any, but what was yeah, great really? I have to say, my <laughs> first experience of the smart car was in 2003 on the Isle of Guernsey. Uh, when I, mm -hmm. I had a little look at one there and I was, I, I, I was just starting to learn to drive. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, that's a really cool car. I want one. When I actually did pass my driving test and I moved up to Lincolnshire, I test drove one um, with a friend. And it was a horrible experience. That first generation of smart car was horrible, horrible car. And this, there is a point to this because I own a second generation, uh, is it third generation? I own a third generation smart car. And the difference in right. performance and handling between those two, between the first and the third is phenomenal. Now, I've driven a first generation electric. I haven't driven a second generation and it's a second generation that are, are in New York now. And if they've made that kind right. of engineering distinction between the first and, and, the, and the second, as they did with the first and the third for the gas cars, I think that they might be onto something. But I don't know. So let's let's talk very quickly, Aaron, um, as you're on. What do geeks look sure. for when they're looking for, for electric cars? Because, you know, geeks, programmers especially, they don't get a bad salary. They, they make a fair bit of money if they're good at what they do and they work in a, in a, in right. a, in a sphere that, that is popular. They can make a fair amount of money. And so they may have this uh, dual income, no kids, 20-somethings um, right. who want to have a nice flashy car to drive around. Of, an, of the, uh, the electric cars now on the market, which one do you think appeals to your bog standard geek the most? <laughs> well, I know which one I, I, I think... appeals to me as a geek, but... but <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the people I, I know are into cars just because I, I also own a, a DeLorean uh, car, not electric conversion or anything like oh, that. Wow. And, well, you know, there's um, been several of those conversions. 
Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, yeah. two of the pe- people who converted them, uh, they live not too far from me. I'm pretty friendly with them, and they did it after uh, seeing the Who Killed the Electric Car movie. Um, right. what, what I found is that people, regardless of if it's an electric car or a gas car or a CNG, they want to tinker with it. They want to hack it. They want to get better range. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I just picked up a, a 2008 Toyota Prius uh, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, I, you know, my wife is like, oh, what color are you going to get it in? And I'm like, no, I want to make sure it has blue tooth in it you know i want to make sure that i can you know press wacky button commands and <laughs> access weird features of, of the computerized system um, and i think that's uh, oh, really what people look for they want yeah. something that'll be uh hackable or things that you can just modify it and you know of course my first thought is ooh, maybe i could turn it into a plug-in hybrid and then i look at the costs and the the risks involved and I, i'm not that geeky <laughs> Not by a long shot. <laughs> well, I have to say, does, does this make me more geekier than now? Because I had a 2003 Toyota Prius, which I hacked to a plug-in Prius and oh. put a Mac in it as well. I did see that, so, actually. That, sorry, was that I, Mike? I that did you say blow up YouTube. as well? Did you say the blowing up too, Mike? <laughs> oh, you said you set fire to it. That I didn't all. set fire to it. There was a bit of a bang that sounded like roasting popcorn. <laughs> At 3 a.m. in the morning, 1 a.m. in the morning, and I ended up in casualty as a consequence. Nothing to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, the first, as soon as I read on on a forum about how there's always the risk of the batteries exploding, that's when I said, oh, okay, this is something I am not going to do. That's the last thing I need is my brand new car to just you know explode on me because I tinkered with it too much. <laughs> Hey, that was fun. I'd explain that when you're late to work, you know? It's like, well, why are you late? Uh, My batteries exploded. Um, Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, um, I think... I think uh, of the cars on the market at the moment, obviously the Tesla is the the dream car, I think, for a lot of... A lot of oh yeah, even the even the Model S vehicles. is, is yeah. beautiful looking. I I've been waiting for them to yeah. make it, and I hope that I can actually save you know my money, and then my wife veto the decision eventually for me to just buy one. Um, but it, it it looks beautiful, and the fact that they have this technology that they're claiming to go 300 miles on a charge, I think is fantastic because that yeah. I think is the breakthrough where you don't have to have a huge infrastructure, just enough infrastructure for people to. Uh, get from point A to point B with maybe one stop. And if they're strategically placed for battery swap stations and things like that, then uh, I, I think a range like that can be great. And we're getting there. Um, Nissan is definitely paving the way. So, yeah, the, it, it's a great time to be into all of this alternative uh, transportation yeah. here. Yeah, and it's kind of funny for those of us who have been in it for, a, through, I think, four years now I've been involved. And I think, Mike, you're about the same, isn't it? About four years uh, four years for electric yeah. cars, yep. Uh, suddenly everyone wants to talk to you because you know about them. It's yeah. kind of bizarre, actually. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. <laughs> I All I know is that I need a four-seat family car, um, uh, which is why I've kind of got my heart set on a Nissan Leaf, although I think at the moment uh, my wife is waving waving all the uh, all the costs associated with adopting at me and going, <laughs> you think we're ever going to be able to afford one of these? <laughs> so um, we have a report now. Um, from the TTX GP, which um, serves to um, to give me an, a kick in a, in a slightly different direction, because as you know, I, I like my motorbikes, um, even though my motorbike failed its MOT on Monday. <laughs> Sniff. They, they, the, the guy at the test station had two things to say. Your, your forks are leaking and your engine sounds like you've dropped a bag of spanners in there. I suggest you take it apart and have a look at it. <laughs> Ooh, they, that's a little harsh yeah yeah anyway this is from the ttx gp with uh, our friend david heron uh, who is a uh, fantastic chap uh, works um uh, on the west coast and he's a programmer as well uh, and uh, he has covered um the ttx gp thus far in uh, in the usa and uh, as soon as I can find the correct link, this is me stalling. As soon as I can find the correct link, I will put him on the uh, screen. In fact, I think what's happened is the uh, yeah, the thing has disappeared. So, Mike, you just fill everyone yes. in on the TTX GP while I uh, I get this video queued up again. The TTX GP. I must admit, I didn't cover this story in much detail, but. Uh, 
Uh, I'll tell you what we could do uh, whilst we're waiting. I have a very brief talk about the, the, the Audi competition for designing an electric car. Sounds good to me. Okay, well, Audi run an annual competition. It's open to anyone at all. It's, it's all in German, unfortunately, but there you go. Uh, and, and it basically allows people to submit ideas or designs to Audi, and winners can win cash prizes or see their ideas being implemented, and in many cases, actually get a job with the company. Uh, this year's competition wow. is called the Electrification of Cars. And, uh, you know, they basically are, uh, you know, you can propose an entire car or a specific piece of technology for, uh, you know, what you'd like to see in a, in a car of the future and, um, you know, see what happens, see whether, whether Audi like the idea. You can do everything from a very simple sketch through to a complete design. It's entirely can up you, to you. Can you do like a really cool, you know, that episode of The Simpsons. Have you seen that episode of The Simpsons where Homer, Homer ends up getting a job with his brother Herb? who is a car executive and Herb <laughs> says you can design a car and it's, it's a Herb is played by Danny DeVito, which is really cool. Um, Homer Simpson and Danny DeVito's Homer Simpson's brother, which is kind of, sorry, I am a Simpsons geek. It must be said. Um, and he designs the Homer, which is the car for every man. And it's got a separate like little pod. It looks like something out of the Jetsons. It's got a separate pod for, for his kids. <laughs> And one for him. Oh, that sounds great! And it idea. looks great. If, so, if you haven't seen that episode, Google it because I'm sure it's online somewhere. Um, <laughs> I'll have to try and remember what it's what it was. But anyway, um, someone said Audi wants to ridicule EV fans. These contests are always rigged. Wow. Well, possibly they are. I, I, mean, I, I, I would is, rather. Is it a bit of fun? Or, or what? Go on, Aaron. Uh, I, I would rather that this contest be uh, hosted by uh, Donald Trump. And, you know, every design that he thinks is horrible, he just goes, you're fired and that's it. You know, you, you're out of here. And, you know, this electric car sucks. You're out of here. You're fired. And then just go from there and, you know, really jazz it up a little. You know, it's all, it's all you, about jazzing it up these days. You know, The Apprentice in the UK is, is currently doing a special edition, special season for young people. So they're doing like The Apprentice with 12-year-olds. It is so wrong. I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. Anyway, we I'm now have... For life. I know. We now have the TTX GP uh, bit, of, um, bit of video from David Heron. So take it away. Hello, everyone. It's the TTX GP North America Report. I am David Heron, and Nikki asked me to bring reports of the TTX GP as they happen. I have attended the first two races and intend to attend several more of them this year. Uh, to introduce myself, I do EV journalism via examiner.com under the name Green Transportation Examiner, and I am also the owner of the VS. I'm not sure what happened to David then. He just vanished, but he's still there. The video is still playing. So playing some. There we go. He's back. So the first thing I want to do. Uh, for this report is go over some background to help you understand what the TTX GP is. Um, the TTX GP is a series of motorcycle races uh, that are focused on uh, zero emissions motorcycles. Uh, effectively, that means electric motorcycles, but their rules are pretty open as to the power source and, and would allow for other things, including biofuels, if you were able to prove that a biofuel was zero emissions, or hydrogen, or whatever. So uh, you, can, you can actually find out a lot about the, the race series at egrandprix.com. That's E-G-R-A-N-D-P-R-I-X.com. Um, so you may have heard of the race which happened last year, which uh, was on the Isle of Man, and, and it happened during the TT race week. Uh, the TT race uh, has a long history, well over 100 years of electric, or, or sorry, of motorcycle racing. Uh, history happened on the Isle of Man in the, in the TT race, and a lot of significant advances uh, happened uh, at that race. So the TTXGP was a, or is, like I said, it's a zero emissions motorcycle race, uh, and Last year was the first year that the TT people allowed electric motorcycles to uh, participate in the racing events. And it was the TTXGP organization uh, who organized the races during the TT week. This year, the TTXGP is a, a series of 13 races 
which are happening in, uh, four in North America, four of them in the UK, four in Italy, and with a final grand championship in Spain. Uh, and that will be in October. Uh, the, the other races are spread throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, so that's a good introduction to the races. Uh, and and there David uh, stops because he had some. Uh, he didn't. He unfortunately ran out a bit, a bit of a time to finish it. But he did say that the yeah. the winners of the competition uh, of that particular <laughs> particular round was the flying banana. That's the name. Very good. <laughs> And, uh, we've got some footage here, I think. There we go, of some of the different cars going around. So I'm going to talk over it to see the cars, or the bikes, racing around the track. As he comes to the start finish line, he has some uh, pretty good distance on James Ford right now. He's just trying to make sure he can bring this thing home. They only made three laps at Infineon. He's trying to make sure that they go further than that here today. Here's Wolf. Isn't that just a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic sound? It electric is. I'll tell you, everyone says electric past. cars don't uh, aren't going to be exciting, but you hear the, the, the sound of a of an electric sports car like the Tesla or a, an electric motorbike, or even the Mitsubishi at, at full pelt. It really does sound, you know, fantastic. Like a muted jet engine. It really does sound great. Well, apparently, the EV1 had a better sound. Absolutely. According to Chelsea, the EV1 just went. <laughs> Nothing says speed like a high-pitched wine. I know. I get really upset when I test drive an electric car that doesn't have that noise. Because my, my electric car doesn't do any of that. It just kind of goes... <laughs> well, that's kind of exciting, too, if you think about that. it. Just the fact time. that there's no noise. Yeah, but it's boring because yeah. it doesn't make any noise. Sorry, Mike, what would you say? I didn't think your electric car was going at the moment. But when it go. runs, you're making sound when the electric car noise. doesn't go. All right, okay. That right. makes that noise. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 I mean, at very low speeds, and you know, all these electric cars are quiet. But uh, you know, certainly, things like the uh, the iMove, you, you put your foot on the accelerator and, and accelerate flat out, and it just sounds like a little, uh, you know, a, 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 a miniature jet aircraft about to take off. <laughs> and the Tesla is even better. I mean, the soundtrack on that, you know, everyone says, okay, you know. You know, you're going to miss the sound of a V8 engine on a sports car. Well, I don't think you will because the the, the sound of a really good electric motor, you know, fantastic. It really is good. I I just I just love the the noise that they make and um, but then being a bit of a, a, a I like I'm a petrol head. I'm sorry, I am a petrol head. <laughs> that there can be no nice way of putting it. I am a guilty petrol head. I'm like one of those naughty Catholic schoolgirls that does something she shouldn't and then sits there for the rest of the day doing some kind of strange penance for doing it. Um, uh, that's pretty much where we're at for the end of the show today. There's one final story that I wanted to touch in, which is um, back to Mercedes. They are installing charging points for their electric mm -hmm. smart cars at every depot. Mm -hmm. And the thing I want to know is, can you go and use them if you're not an electric smart car driver? Yeah, no, nobody knows yet. I've asked Mike, you and I are going to have to try um, this out, I think. Absolutely. I think you're going to have to try, try this out. I'm hoping to borrow a Tesla. Uh, they have had a charging point at the uh, at a Mercedes-Benz uh, head office in Milton Keynes for some time, and they have been uh, open yeah, to they have, uh, I've used other it. vehicle owners. So, so hopefully that that will continue with these other ones they're putting at each one of their dealers. The other thing which is interesting is in the last week, uh, electric car charging points have been opening up in Birmingham and Coventry in the United Kingdom. At the moment, however, they're only for people who are on the small electric car trial that's uh, that's running. You are in, joking. Um, well, I've already had a go at them about that, and apparently they are now going to open that up to everyone, which is fantastic news. This is me with They're my mouth open. 36 charging points. I know, there's 36 charging points will be opening up in and around the Mid West Midlands wow. and the United Kingdom over the next few months, which is fantastic. That's in addition to the ones which have already opened up in places like Leamington Spa. Brilliant. And Leicester and Stoke my and places like that. So, so it's really good my news. My hope is in about a year's time, I'll be able to go and see my mum 
who lives on the other side of the UK. It's about 270 miles away, something like that. I'd be able to go and see yep. her in an electric car with the kids, with the dogs, piling in the back. We'll stop somewhere at, at lunchtime, get a fast charge, and we'll be there. Um, That'd be great. But at the moment, no, not not happening. And it really bugs me. I don't know what it is about British people. I mean, I'm going to have a British people rant now. So I'll put my Canadian hat on for a second and pretend <laughs> that I'm fully Canadian instead of half Canadian. <laughs> uh, for some reason, it's this bureaucracy. Oh, you can't. Oh, no, you can't use that charging point. You're not one of us. You don't live in our borough. You don't pay our taxes. You can't use our charging point. You're a foreigner. Or... Um, what do we have from our local council? Oh, no, you can't use those points. You're not employed by the council. Those points are for council employees only. And I go, well, look, do you, can no one's using them. That's the thing that really bugs me. Sorry, I'm just mm. having a bit of a rant now. Uh, they say, no one's using these points. Why can't I use them? Oh, no, they're only for council employees. And yeah, oh, for goodness sake, get Here we go. They, they, they should install uh, some, uh, some sort of payment system onto them. Where, yeah. you know, if you don't yeah. qualify, you don't work for whatever company it is, you swipe your credit card and they say, okay, here you go for, you know, two, three dollars. You know, you, you, you get, you know, X amount of time yeah, in order absolutely. to charge and that would offset the cost. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know what? Yeah. I, I know most people that have electric cars would not mind paying for it. And every, mm. every any time I've ever had to stop absolutely. unexpectedly, I've always offered to pay for it. And it's been... It's been bizarre. And I was at a pub yesterday in Derbyshire and uh, sitting outside and I went, oh, wow. I said, you could charge a Tesla up here. So if you live in Derbyshire and you want to go to a pub that's got 30 amps worth of power sitting in the car park. And, and it would be good for Ooh. you as well, Mike, because it's within your your it charging would. range as well. And you just uh, yeah, just plug in and, and off you go. And uh, they didn't, Fantastic. they weren't aware. They went, oh, wow, well, it's just because we're by a marina. We've just got power for the boats. And I went, it would be good for electric cars as well. Um, just Fantastic. get that infrastructure up and running and uh, and doing. And I'm borrowing a Tesla over the summer at some point. So I'm mm. hoping that, that I'll make, maybe make a trip up there oh. and try it out. A little jealous. So, uh, I wish I could just say I'm borrowing a Tesla, but I don't think that's going <laughs> to Oh, happen. believe me, it's taken me a long time and a lot of cajoling and a lot of begging <laughs> and a lot of bargaining. No blackmail, <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm not you saying I wouldn't your stoop soul. to that. You know, nothing major. You know, I wouldn't stoop maybe that low, but it, it, that's a possibility. Anyway, that is it for today. Next week, we're going to have a new sponsor on the show. Very excited about that. Yay. It's all to do with the wonderful Woo-hoo. world of audiobooks. Ha ha. <laughs> and if you're a regular listen to, listener to other podcasts, you probably figure out who we've got on board. So I'm kind of kind of pleased on that. Um, uh, but we'll we'll tell you more about that next week. In the meantime, mm. thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you are in the alternative energy sphere and you want to stick around, I believe in about 20 minutes time, there is going to be an episode of This Week in Energy. We're doing a pre-record in about 10, 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm just finding out now. Um, it's, no, it's not. It's just been postponed. <laughs> the guest, I don't know what it is with my guest this week. I just had an email saying, we can't do it. Please, can we postpone? I'm like, yes, okay, that's fine. I don't mind. I'll go and take my motorcycle apart and, and pretend I'm not an electric car person. So, Aaron, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Where can people find out more about you? We're going to do some host swapping uh, well, next week, th- I understand. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me on Transport Evolved. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Uh, you guys can find me at the GeekCast podcast, which is geekcastonline.com, also on Twitter as the GeekCast. And yes, uh, Nikki, you'll be coming on the show uh, a week from uh, yesterday, yesterday, and w- yeah. that show will be up a week from today, which will be very exciting. We're really happy to have uh, another guest on our show for uh, somebody who's into alternative energy as much as I am. Well, I think as I said to you last time, I'm a geek, 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 and I'll show you how much of a geek I am. She says, <laughs> you can't see this. Everyone in the chat room can see this. This is a PowerBook oh, G3. Oh, I see it. 500 megahertz G3 PowerBook. Ooh. And I'm just this weekend, Ooh. one of my projects is to turn a picture frame, an old Mac into a picture frame. Uh, that's a nice project. I because like that. That will definitely be awesome. Recycling. That's a great uh, laptop, by the way. I've used that a few times. It, it was a sturdy little guy. Yeah, no, that's that's one of the girls' laptops. Um, 
so uh so that's that's pretty cool so that's that's good uh so anyway well thanks very much for joining us and i hope you'll come on again at some point in a future uh show uh, mike of course is it owning electric car.com yeah i got it right for once and i'm at uh, one. a minor journey on twitter mike is at mike boxwell aaron you are at the geek cast uh, at the geek cast there you go um, and of course, this show is at Evolve Transport because I'm annoyed with Twitter. Whoever designed Twitter decided that they were going to have a character limit to the number of uh, characters you can have. And Transport Evolved is just one too many. So you Evolve Transport fits. Don't ask me why. It's just the way it works. It's just the way it works. We'll be back next week, won't we, Mike? With some fantastic we new guests and some fantastic new news um oh feedback if you have feedback for the show we'd love mm. to hear from you and the email address for that i must apologize because i've realized a couple of people have been trying to leave feedback for us the email addresses for transport evolved has been a little bit screwed up so if you want to give us feedback just for this week please email us at transport evolved at littlecolly.com and then hopefully next week once google allows me to log back into my domain um, we'll set the correct email addresses up, but just for next week. Thanks to Steve over at graphicsplant.com. He, the designer of this fantastic logo there, and he's going to be doing a brand new site for us. I'm hoping to catch up with him on Sunday um, and uh, sort out the, uh, the new site design. Uh, thanks also, of course, to Squarespace, who host our website very kindly. Um, we pay them, but they, they do a nice service, so it's always good to thank them for doing good services and uh, mm. and as always i've forgotten my catchphrase it's don't forget to use less gas <laughs> my name is nikki gordon bloomfield and my box well take care we'll see you soon take care bye bye, bye.